concept of automation, right? And we've been working together for almost five years. And you have come a long way and you will tell us about what you're doing and what your experience is. So welcome on stage, Marcus. So, so what is Angela? Angela is a platform, a global platform, which is delivering enterprise network services. And it is doing it uh, by an alliance approach together with a lot of telecommunication partners. And I will explain a little bit uh, how it really works during my talk. But I can already tell you um, that automation is very much at the core of what we are doing. And I personally, I'm a very strong believer that automation is an absolute necessity if it comes to scale of the solution. And Frederick is going to offend you. But uh, I can give you a hint why your law and example is not so efficient. <laughs> right. Because it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale. <laughs> the problem is it's a one-time implementation. And of course, if you go for automation in a one-time implementation, the effort you need to put into automation is too high to grab the benefit out of it. Yep. So standardization, automation, and scalability doesn't does go together. And unfortunately, as long as you don't have similar more properties where you can use your uh, automation for your lawn cutting, I believe it will never pay off for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's uh, disappointing, but I'm still committed. <laughs> you know, he has to learn a little bit about how it really works, guys. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy um, to be here with you. And I think um, we already got a little bit into the story. And I want to share with you why um, we came up with the idea of, of Jenna. Yes, I need to see how I get that on. You can help me? I think you, you manage that one. Um, and there's a lot of challenges with uh, today's enterprise, right? It is globalization, it is uh, digitization of the business process, it is moving to the cloud. And unfortunately, many of the existing architectures, network architectures, doesn't really support this kind of developments and doesn't support this enterprise. It has to do with that still the networks are very much local, that we still have quite manual business processes in, in many of the uh, network operations. And that finally, if you want to serve enterprise customers, which are most of them are international or even global, it's still a patchwork of different uh, services which you need to bring together. And of course, if it is not standardized, it's damn hard to have an efficient operation. So the idea of Jenna was to develop something which would overcome this situation and would help the customers to deliver especially, I would say, services which are more flexible and much faster for implementation. Um, because I believe the classical network architectures still have proven to deliver high quality. They have proven to deliver quite okay MLAs um, from the stability and business performance perspective, but it has been extremely slow in adapting innovations and extremely difficult to really change it. And as flexibility and speed of implementation becomes more and more, more, and more important for the business customers, this is something we as an industry have to deliver and here I believe automation plays really a crucial role. So having said that, let me explain a little bit how Jenna really works and what it really is. In the first place, Jenna is an abbreviation and stands for the Next Generation Enterprise Network Alliance. So in the first place, it is an alliance of leading telecommunication companies which work a little bit like in the economy of sharing model, which you also have found very successful in consumer areas, being like the Airbnbs or the Ubers, 
where they share infrastructure assets to deliver globally consistent services. A little bit similar is what we are doing um, at Jenna. Here, the leading telcos are sharing their strong local network assets. And in doing this, it allows all of them to deliver truly global consistent services. How does it really work? It works because there is a company which I have the pleasure to lead, um, which has developed a global platform which, is, which connects all these local ad assets and finally turns this local assets into a consistent global end-to-end -end as Ivan service. So the platform itself is built on latest technology, is fully virtualized, so fully embracing the philosophy of the network function virtualization, and it is automated from an end-to-end -end perspective. Because, as I mentioned in the beginning, this end-to-end -end automation is the only way how you can flexibly and very fast deploy the services on the global, global scale to fulfill the customer needs. So this is more or less the basics of what we're doing at Jenna. So two <laughs> primary pillars. One is the lines approach to have the local assets which are turned into a consistent end-to-end -to -end network platform. And on the other hand, it's a technology platform itself, fully virtualized, end-to-end -to -end automated, which allows us to deliver the service. Let us have a very brief look into what is the ecosystem which we could bring together. Um, this kind of business model and solution I'm describing, of course, we couldn't do ourselves as a, as a startup company. So we have built the ecosystem really delivering this service. And this ecosystem has two major areas. One is our, what we call alliance partners, which are the telcos delivering the network assets. The other piece is our technology partners helping us to develop the platform, the fully automated platform. So I do not want to read out all um, our partners, but you see that we meanwhile have more than 20 partners covering all of the different geographies around the world, which includes in Europe, partners like British Telecom, Deutsche Telekom, A1, and so on. In um, Asia, China, Unicor, APEC, uh, Telstra, and others. So US, CenturyLink, or Telus, um, and, and, and. So I think there is not a single area left where we couldn't deliver uh, good quality <coughs> services via our alliance partners. On the technology side, um, the prime technology partner is Cisco. And, uh, the, and I will explain uh, how we are using NSO and other technologies of Cisco to really have a build that, that platform, um, which is finally uh, a full Cisco stack. It starts uh, with the IT infrastructure. It has all of the NSD functions, the VNF creating the services itself, and the whole um, orchestration stack, as well as, of course, the edge devices um, to deliver the services. On top of that one, we have built a full IT stack. The IT stack includes all the components of a BSS, business support system, as well as an OSS, operational support system. We do that together with a Polish company based in Krakow, which is called Comarch. So Comarch and Cisco together are the key technology partners to deliver the technology stack, which makes up our platform. And last but not least, we have teamed up with Equinix because we need to have some local data center um, assets where we can host uh, our platform and we are also happy to have Equinix as a partner for all the uh, cloud exchange platform which we are using to reach out to all the uh, cloud platforms around the world. So this is more or less the ecosystem 
which is supporting our business model and our service delivery. Um, to give you some overview on how really the platform looks like. So the platform has two major components. One is a distributed set of, of data centers. So all the dots you see on the slides are the data centers, which are more or less hosting um, our service platform. If I talk about the service platform, it is a standard IT environment. Um, we are using an OpenStack deployment, uh, CBIM as a, as a standard uh, register is providing. And we are running a completely virtualized service platform on top of that OpenStack environment to deliver all the different telco services from the switching, routing, firewalling, application optimization, and so on, all as a part of the or in, uh, in, the, in the essence of the, of the DNS, which, uh, which are deployed there. And these data centers are also hosting all our orchestration and management applications as well. The lines you see connecting the dots are our private backbone. So we are managing the traffic flows between the different data centers where our platform is running ourselves to optimize the traffic flows on a global scale. Um, how does it then really, really work? At each of the data centers, which we call is our Jena hubs, we could also call it its Jena nodes, we are connecting in the local networks of our alliance partners. We run a complete hybrid network approach. This means we are always connecting into the internet platforms as well as into the private network platforms of our partners. So in essence, we are supporting the internet in the means of broadband and business internet as well as Ethernet. The architecture itself has a very strict separation between the transport underlay and the service overlay. This very strict separation allows us to run an end-to-end -end consistent service from any CPE of a customer to any other CP of the customer network around the world, completely independent more or less of the real transport underlay. It means we can run our services on copper, fiber, 4G, 5G, satellite, whatever you like, as long as public internet or Ethernet as a protocol is a, is a transport. So we are extremely flexible in leveraging existing connectivity or connection, uh, means of connection. Um, what we have done is we have very much standardized the designs, how we connect the customer location to our network platform. We have chosen very simple naming, so the t-shirt sizes, so we have very simple designs. The smallest one is what we call XS, extra small design. It's a single internet link. We have an M design, which is a combination of uh, Ethernet link and an internet link. Or we have redundant Ethernet links. We even have more complex designs than what you see here on that slide. For example, an L plus, which comes with two redundant Ethernet links and two redundant internet links um, to also provide internet rate out for larger sites. So typically you find the smaller designs for connecting branch offices or smaller sales offices and you find the more complex designs to connect headquarters or the very large ones even connecting the data centers of customers um, to, to the network platform. 
All these designs are typically available with different bandwidths between one megabit and one gig. Um, this is a basic setup. The interesting piece then is how we have managed to deploy but also to run the complete life cycle management in a fully automated manner. And this is what I want to focus on now. So if you look a little deeper, deeper into that end-to-end -end orchestration, I want to start first more with the DSS and OSS part, which is finally exposing a single pane of glass approach to our alliance partners, which are doing the configuration of this enterprise rate networks for their customers. And what they can do there, they can reach out to that to the portals and they can design a global quite complex customer or enterprise solution um, on, on that portal. This portal also has uh, direct uh, links, APIs to availability and pricing information of our alliance partners. So it really supports uh, on a single uh, portal the complete sales cycle um, of the partner. So it starts with a quoting via the online interface that can be done for a global solution within hours in just typing in the uh, locations uh, which needs to be connected and giving the bandwidth requirements and giving the different designs you want to choose. But it supports you also not just for the coding, but also for the detailed design, for the ordering, and even on a single process flow later on for the whole life cycle. Because you're moving all your data from one process step to the next one. This data capture and design and customer interaction is then linked to the real production uh, platform. So there is really an end-to-end -end IT automation. It all works based on the global service catalog. This means all services which are available on that global platform are in a single catalog and you simply select the services like you would do typically on an Amazon or other uh, buying platform, select the services, and the orchestration later on ensures that all the services you have collected fits together and builds a consistent platform. The components which we run on the DSS OSS portal includes a custom relationship management. It has the solution the configurator. It's a similar like you would uh, have for the car configurator. Um, you have the whole support for the order management. Um, then later on the supporting the business processes as you have all the pricing information at the same time. There we do the invoicing, but also the life cycle uh, topics with regards to complaint management, are supported here um, as well. Very important, of course, is a proper product management and design. So all the services itself are described in comprehensive data models. Here we use a young data model. So, and, uh, so that all the information which you later on need for fully automated deployments resides in that data models and all the services are comprehensively described uh, by, by exactly the data model. On the boss side, we have the full uh, complex fulfillment processes being supported, ordering of lines, ordering of CTEs, all the workflows and processes which you need to run to implement the services. And last but not least, in case of incidents, you have the travel ticket uh, management and then connecting also with the systems of our alliance partners. This just are two uh, screenshots. So everything is portal oriented. It provides you full transparency during the ordering 
and later on configuration approach, not just the technical, but also already during the design with all the commercial information and during the life cycle uh, management of the solution, it provides the full transparency on the performance of the network, delivering all the technical parameters like availability, round trip delay, packet loss, and so on, as well as all the information around incidents, tickets, and ticket status. So full transparency on what's going on on that global um, platform. Now I think it gets more to the point where we are here for the NSO developer day. How does it really work after you have captured the data, after the design is done, then what is the outcome out of that process typically is a quite complex service model of an enterprise solution. This information is then forwarded to our technical platform. And the recipient of that information is the first instance of the NSO. We call it, it's a central service orchestrator. It's a specifically, I would say, configured instance of the NSO, which takes care about all the global service needs uh, which which relates to the customer solution. So it finally, after receiving the uh, service model from the boss system, you could argue it is somehow responsible for the area of the abstracted network. So it's a network abstraction layer which we have generated. For example, it ensures the proper flow of uh, data um, of traffic between the different data centers. We call it, it's a so-called inter-hub traffic if controlled via this global service orchestrator. It is more or less the customer uh, service facing um, entity and it is also then orchestrating the resource facing instances which are other deployments of the NSO, which are running on the hubs itself. So the CSO is a single deployment in a central data center. It's orchestrating everything which needs to be orchestrated on the global scale. And it is also orchestrating the local orchestrators, the NSOs running on the 20 hubs distributed around the world. So service uh, abstraction, network abstraction, and the third layer of orchestration is a hardware abstraction. The hardware abstraction is then done with a, I would say, more classical NSO at the different hubs, and it is ensuring that all the virtualized instances on the hub side are completely orchestrated, and as well, it is responsible for the orchestration of the decentral components of the CPEs the endpoints of the network. In this architecture, we talk about a layered service architecture because we have the service model, the network abstraction, and the hardware abstraction layer. So at least three different layers of abstraction. And you will see it on the next, on the next page. And then the orchestrator are even beneath the third layer of abstraction. So to have a little bit in-depth view of the uh, architecture, so we talked about what's going on on the DSS OSS layer. I have explained how the customer facing services and global service orchestration works. Now let us have a little bit deeper look into what's going on on the hub side itself, so on the different regional data centers managing the hardware abstraction so we have our NSO engine. And what's this NSO engine is doing? Of course, it is orchestrating together with the ESC, the more or less bringing up the right infrastructure resources on the OpenStack environments. It is also bringing up the right 
infrastructure elements on the decentral component of the EMCS x86 um, V branch uh, devices. And it is also more or less orchestrating our classical network equipment, which we are using for the backbone and we are using as a gateway for collecting the uh, traffic from the platforms of our lines partner, which are the classical ASR routers. Very important, of course, is the interaction with the vManage. So the NSO takes care about creating the right CLI templates and uh, more or less pushing it to the API of the vManage, which then is setting up the SD WAN configurations for the special customer network according to the collected data, configuration data um, on the BOSS um, system. But we are not just running the SD WAN um, as a service on that platform, we are also running a lot of additional um, VNF uh, in the area of security, so the firewall. Uh, other virtualized or WSA, um, as well further uh, VNF to do application optimization and other services. So it is not just the SD WAN, but it comes with a lot of additional services which you need for enterprise network as well. And all that is orchestrated at the local, regional level via the NSO uh, running on the different. Um, hubs. So this is the overall architecture which we have implemented, which allows us that after you have interacted with the uh, BOSS portal, and if you have done the uh, service design uh, at the service orchestrator, um, pressing the button, and not a single person anymore needs to do any kind of engineering for a global, complex enterprise solution because this fully automated architecture and workflows allows us, without any manual interaction, to do complete deployment on a global scale. And I want to show it to you on a more specific example that you get an idea what is really going on in um, using and in really deploying a customer solution. So it's here you have a simple customer network um, which have locations in Germany, US and in Hong Kong and uh, an alliance partner want to serve a customer and the customer is asking for new sites which should be brought up in California, in the US, or in Frankfurt, um, and he want to have it deployed, right? So what's going on is the line partner is giving this customer requirements uh, into the boss poll, just entering and selecting the respective services. After he has done that, um, and ordered uh, the service, then the boss system, of course, initiates all the workflows and service requests which are necessary for fulfillment. And this has to do with ordering, of course, of the respective CPs to support the services according to the bandwidth needs and the access designs. Of course, the access links with the local telcos needs to be ordered, but also then this service request needs to be sent to the central service orchestrator to initiate the bringing up of the required resources um, on the virtualized platform. So it sends it to the central service orchestrator running in the central data center. So what then this central service orchestrator is doing, it decomposes the service request into the elements, which are finally three. It's an element which needs to bring up the resources in the hub covering or serving Germany for Frankfurt, which is serving the uh, US to bring up the service in California. And of course, it needs to bring up also 
the uh, elements to talk for, between the US and, 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 and Germany. So these are the three steps which are initially initiated. If this is done, of course, the local NSOs need to bring up, according to the architecture, which I have shown in my previous slide, all the respective instances, meaning the virtualized environments on the OpenStack uh, IT platform running in the data center in Germany and in the US, and to initiate the control as well as the data plane on the, on the hubs. So with what does it mean in concrete? The vManage needs to be instantiated. After the vManage, you need to initiate the vSmart, the vBond. You also need to initiate the vEdge clouds because to run the traffic from an end-to-end -end perspective between the US and Germany, you need to have respective virtualized instances of routers running on the hubs as well. And all these components are brought up uh, via the NSO after the local NSO have received a service request from the central service orchestrator. All this is going on after the service request is sent. And these instances are now more or less already brought up and are, you could say, in the sleeping mode. They are waiting until the endpoints get connected to them. How does this work? We find that on step five. Because CPEs already have been ordered in step two. After a while, they are delivered. And if the lines are delivered as well, you connect the CPEs to that lines, and the CPEs are sent completely empty. There's nothing on it, more or less. The only capability the swappers have is to call back to a central server, being reconnected to our platform, and after this is done, the NSO ensures that the respective configurations which are already residing on the platform level are pushed down to the CPE. This is what's going on after CPEs have been delivered and have been registered on the, on the platform. No configuration on site, not any manual work to be done, rather than the pure physical bringing on site and connecting cable. Then the last step before you can really use and have finally deployed the service is of course that the local NSO is finally bringing up the service, integrating the new sites into the existing network, and the USB one is up and running. And the interesting thing here is the deployment of new sites works exactly the same way as you are doing changes. So if you want to reconfigure a network, you simply go to the boss portal, change the configuration you want to change, you press a button, and the more or less the workflow without the physical thing, because they're already implemented, runs through the layer service orchestration, and your network is updated on a global scale consistently within you. That is the way what we have implemented. The platform is up and running since mid of last year. We meanwhile have uh, the first customers in, in rollout. We have more than 20 uh, pilot customers already on that platform. And uh, I can tell you it was really amazing to see uh, after we had developed that platform that it really works. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody who has been uh, in that industry, uh, I'm, I'm Many years in that, in that industry, uh, it is completely fascinating to see that you really can do something on a central portal and deploy globally in a consistent manner without anybody even touching 
any of the different layers of your architecture and of your infrastructure anymore. So that is what it's all about. And just to close my, uh, my talk, so what is really what the SD-WAN as a service really means? And before I uh, summarize it, maybe to share some of my, my personal views here. I started uh, with talking uh, with Frederick about um, efficiency and that the effort of automation needs to pay off, right? And it pays off if you can scale. And this is, I think, very, very important, um, that you create something where the effort which you put into automation pays off because you can replicate or multi multiply it in selling it and delivering it to, to your customers. I personally believe that's very, very important. And the other one um, is the as a service means that the complexity, I believe, is so high that it, and it needs so much engineering and effort to really build it um, that for most of the people, meaning the customers and so on, it is much simpler and the much better way of consuming it as a service rather than going for the multiple implementations next to each other individually, customer per customer. So I personally believe that virtualization, moving the network to a cloud platform, automation, and moving towards a as a service approach really goes together. In some way, they are twins, and, and really, you can't really differentiate or cut them into pieces because they, they all have to come together. This is what we have, have tried to do. And to more or less summarize it, what it is, it's finally about delivering a really hybrid VPN, which is more than just a VPN, it's really an enterprise network service platform, which allows you to have a broad variety of different access designs and value-added services, so giving you a high flexibility, but the elements itself are highly standardized, because only if you have highly standardized elements you can go for an end-to-end -end automation. You can't do that with these both approaches. But as all the, the customers in the enterprise environment are different, you need to have modular services so that you still can build quite flexible solutions out of that one. This is what we have done, and not just on the product level, but also on the process level and the interaction model. It all comes back to a strong alliance approach with strong partners in the different regions. It is completely central, centrally managed. It's a single pane of glass approach where you can reach out to all the services, which makes it easy for all the different business processes. And last but not least, it's only possible because of the all the cool new development which we have and uh, NSO and automation is a major piece of it. Thanks a lot. All right. Do you have any questions? You may please ask them now. If we see any hands raised, we'll have a hand mic carried out to you. OK, we have one up in the corner. Hello. Hello. Do you plan on uh, covering the Middle East soon? Yes, we do. That's great. Absolutely. It's a very important region as well. I have a question, Marcus. Uh, yes. I know that you started out 
planning to use what was then called IWAN 3.0 technology. And then you changed and are now using SD-WAN with Telabase. What was the impact of that change in your architecture? So if you remember the, the architecture, um, then I was very happy to see that the upper part of the complete architecture could be used unchanged because the layered service orchestration, the BSS uh, BOS system, the central service orchestration and the local service orchestration more or less could stay exactly the same. What we were doing is just on the fourth level, more or less removing the IVAN controller and respective VNF and replacing it with the Detailer stack. Of course, there also had to be some changes and new developments on the function packs because the technologies, one being based on Lisp, the other uh, being on the Detailer specific protocols, is different. But from an architectural point of view, the architecture has been proven that even if you go for a fundamental change of sd wan technologies from IVAN 3.0, to the tailor, we did not need to change our service architecture, but just replace the specific components within that architecture. Hello, uh, this is Kamal. I have another question. So are you supporting multi-vendor sg one So since we are talking on Cisco Vitala, and since you know, most of the size provider are looking for a multi-vendor approach, uh, if you're talking about Vodafone or uh, Infarty or from India, Geo, so most of them have no much presence in all over the world. So looking for a multi-vendor SD1. So in that aspect, how are you supporting? So we are not supporting multi-vendor. And I can tell you, explain to you why. You know, if you go for a network finally as a service, the technology, how you delivers a service doesn't differentiate you, right? So there is no red uh, package or blue package which is delivered finally to, to the end customer. It, it is a service which needs to be clearly defined. It needs to fulfill the flexibility and the quality needs of the customer. And the technology is a means of delivering it. So for us, we are concentrating together with Cisco of creating this type of service platform, delivering the services the customer is requesting. And I personally don't see any advantage in having different technologies delivering exactly the same service without any kind of differentiation and just driving complexity on a global platform like health. Because you need to understand, if you go for an end-to-end -end automation on a global scale, and you would work with, with different technologies on the same platform, it multi complexity is multiplied with no additional value for customers. So we definitely will not do that. Yes, yes. yes. And it meant to support any inventory on any of the architectorials, like so. How do you handle underlay resources? So we have the full um, asset management in, as part of our boss system. So we have a complete transparent inventory, and uh, yeah. I haven't talked about it, but also the full um, service assurance oh. is part of the orchestrated uh, approach, orchestration approach. This means that um, all the elements we are bringing up are kept with the uh, respective information to which uh, customer solution and so on, all this belongs. So we have full transparency, for example, if something breaks or has an incident, which type of services are impacted, and we bring back this kind of information to the ball system and into the tickets in a fully automated manner as well. And all that is possible because we have a 100% transparent view on all the 
tangible and intangible assets running on our platform. So asset management is one key piece of the architecture. So, so basically centralize and then push top down on the yes. software. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And if if uh, uh, virtualized instances are brought up by the orchestration, this information is brought back and being recorded in the in the database as well. So we have that information. Right, no more questions. Question down there? Where is my coming? Concerns the workflow. Yeah. The workflow inside um, your function pack. Uh, have you deal? Have you developed the, the workflow inside the function pack so it can handle all the different um, uh, nano services? Should I say that? If yeah. Not, um, is that correct? No, it's absolutely correct. For example, to, to give you uh, one complete example, um, you may remember in that uh, layer, which uh, is the NSO function pack layer running on the on the local instances, we do, for example, service chaining, right? So for secure internet breakouts, we do service chaining with the firewall and the WSA, meaning uh, the back security appliance, and bringing up that service, and it also includes a virtualized router as well. So the service chain with the virtualized router, the firewall, and the web security are brought up, and we are doing exactly this workflow-oriented bringing up and service chaining via the NSO. It's inside NSO, so you you, you never uh, go up to your BS, BOSS no. to to handle this uh, this workflow. No. So it's inside NSO. Yes. Uh, using an uh, NSO workflow package, or uh, is it handled in the code? I think it is handled in the in the function pack itself, in the way okay. RD is coded there. But the the approach is very much top down. So okay. we bring back some of the status messages and fulfillment information, but from a workflow orientation, it is always top down, from boss down to the uh, Local and the instances. At the CFS level, yes. CFS level, you handle this workflow. It's just a question. So I think the uh, the sequence of bringing up things, if it is needs to be service chained and so on, is handled in the function in the function. Okay, thank you. And my second question concerns the resilience of your own solutions. How do you succeed to? Uh, to, 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 to build a network which um, uh, cures, cures itself with the Cisco assurance you mean because you, you talk about um, um, you talk about this um, uh, this analytics this yes. uh, Cisco assurance so you 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 supervise the service uh, the service uh, of the customers. So when something is wrong, do you uh, redeploy something or do a recheck or? No. Uh, it's, it's a question. So, yeah. so what we do is we do fully automated um, uh, monitoring. We collect all event and metric data. We uh, filter. We aggregate and we create incident tickets fully automated. This is fully automated. But the reaction on the incidents which are created are still manual. What we have not done is implement, implemented an automatic kind of repair or reinstall. I think it requires first real experience and learning before I would go for an automated redeployment or an automated corrective measure based on, on that findings. 
we definitely think into that uh, direction, but I believe it needs a lot of learning. And if you have done it X times manually, and if you know that this is a right corrective measure, then you can think about going for automation in that area as well. Okay. Or then we have not done yet this yet. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I think we should uh, close the questions right now. Um, we have a small agenda update since we had this delay in the registration phase. So um, we will move SoftBank to after lunch since Ali Fitzgaham from TELUS got a, a late cancellation. So we're going to have a break now. But I'd like to thank you, Marcus, for a very good talk. Thank you. Thank you. And here, and here, and here. Cisco, the bridge to possible.